My name's George Mellican. Work with the Education Scotland Digital Learning and Teaching Team and what I'd like to do is take you through um, some um, slides to get started. So um, hopefully you're able to see those on the screen just now. So um, what I'll do is I'll go through the first wee part and then I'll stop and see if there are any questions um, to consider. So I said we titled the session "Making Your Virtual Classroom More Real." So whether whether you're you're in class or out of class, or you, you know if you're using a virtual classroom, that could be done in the school, and it might be used to support home learning, um, homework, uh, or learning at home, or any of those um, different um, ways that you're delivering the learning. But the, the key part is to get that classroom that is um, virtual, but it also feels like your real classroom. Why, why would we have to do that? So there's some slides there just pointing out there about the, the digital technologies. The OECD recognises um, that, that how important digital um, skills and digital literacies are to young people for now and for the future. So as educators, we've certainly got to make sure we stay abreast of those um, skills and competencies that we are able to deliver digitally and demonstrate that digital literacy and those digital skills to our young people. Um, because that's going to be required for their, their life and their work, um, I say not only now but in the future. Digital technology is a huge part of Scotland's economy, so again, more and more jobs are requiring those skills. So if we want to um, give learners the best opportunity to have the most options in life, they're going to need those digital skills, so there's some information there. What I'd like you to consider in this session then tonight is, um, we've all got that shared why, and it's about learning and teaching. Um, effective use of assessment and, and how we use that to make our decisions to take our learners forward in the learning. So that is the, the key, regardless of whether it's virtual, it's it's in the flesh, um, whether it's it's maths, literacy, it, irrespective, we're always considering that part about learning and teaching um, and meeting the needs of the learners there. And again, what I'd ask you to consider then is if you've got to take any of these ideas forward, um, always having that thought in your mind, what is it I'm, I'm trying to do here? Um, using digital tools doesn't really um, impact the learning necessarily. It, it's got to be meeting those ease and O's, those planned learning experiences that you have for your learners. And again, considering how you're going to assess that and know it's had an impact. And again, thinking about that when you're, you're, you're trying to work out how to use these ideas in your own class to meet their needs. How will you know that that change is taking place and how has that change improved the learning? Um, so, so if you go from doing a piece of writing in their jaw to doing a piece of writing in Word, what, what change are you going to measure and how are you not going to know that it was Word that, that has had that impact um, and, and not perhaps that you taught it differently? So, so trying to pick that apart can be tricky sometimes, but I'm sure it's the sort of thing that we're all steeped in there um, and, and those kind of um, ideas coming from the, the How Good Is Our School self-evaluation. So when we are considering using the activities we're going to talk about in this session, always comes back to that moderation cycle, always comes back to the learner and how um, we plan that assessment that's going to help our learners make their steps forward in learning. So th there's some great activities that you sometimes, and, and I see them myself sometimes, uh, I'm fortunate enough that a part of my job is to, to take the time and consider how I would use it, but I remember being in the classroom and you sometimes see an activity and you think, that's great. Um, and I found myself thinking, but where does it fit into my teaching in my classroom? And, and when I can't answer that easily, then it makes me wonder about if it's an effective piece of learning and teaching. Is, is it, it looks good. It looks like a lot of fun, but I'm thinking to myself, is that really impacting my learners? And if, if it's not a quick and obvious answer to that, then the, the chances are, irrespective of how much fun it looks uh, or how engaging it looks, it, it might not be what my learners need. So always putting your learners' needs in that assessment for learning at the start so definitely worth going back to revisit the moderation cycle there. I put this slide in um, just in a, again regardless of the different bits of digital technology um, you see this slide from the educational endowment um, oh, what's their foundation the WEF there so they've got um, feedback there is probably having the biggest impact so again all the way through this considering that's a great activity I'd love to use that with my class um, however how do I feed back on the learning how do I use what they've done in that digital activity that online activity how do I feed back to them that that is um, 
impact in, on the learning positively. So how do I give them that feedback um, to help them move forward? You'll see digital there does have a good impact. Lots of evidence around that, but there is also a cost. So it's, it's not just about throwing digital in there. We've got to think about how we use it for collaboration and feedback um, for our learners as well to, to help take them forward. Digital alone won't, won't help with that. Just a wee quick point here about our digital vision diagrams, um, just to help you ensure that breadth. So you're not always doing the same thing about, you know, um, skills for working, um, connecting with others here, that you know, you've considered the kind of breadth that um, digital learning activities for your learner to develop um, more roundly there. So, so just think about being creative. And again, the, there's two parts to this. I get this, um, a great explanation of this from my colleague Stephen um, and the creativity team and I hope uh, I don't misrepresent it. Um, we can be really creative as teachers, we can plan great creative lessons around things like learning the times tables but at the end of it knowing the times tables is not a particularly creative thing, they might have learned it in a really creative manner but what our learners are able to do is remember facts and recall that knowledge which is important but knowing your times tables isn't a particularly creative endeavour. Um, it's something we need to know. Um, you can teach it really creatively. And on the other side of that, we could have, um, sometimes it might appear the, the dullest, um, most straightforward lesson in the world where you, you use a, a presentation to explain some ideas and concepts, but your learner's response to that could be really, truly creative. So again, um, I, I did some learning with, with my class. Um, on different artists um, and, and what was great was you know I took them through um, some examples of the artist uh, a bit of biographical information and how the, the artist's approach was different from others and then my learners were able to um, sort of um, mimic that in the first instance but then we get some great examples of um, we, we had a, a discussion about um, different um, alternatives to school uniform and, and you know when some of your learners start to say oh we could use a, a Claude Matisse inspired pattern because we learned about that in art and for me the lesson was quite straightforward I gave them examples asked them to replicate or duplicate some of those examples but it's that application of learning when your learner comes up with something really creative um, which um, wasn't necessary you know so it wasn't a creative lesson but the outcome can be really creative so if we plan for creative outcomes then we certainly engage the learners it doesn't have to be the most exciting lesson in the world it's just going to be effective but um, giving the learners the opportunity to be creative um, certainly um, engages them and the last wee part here um, what digital learning look like is a document we published in January it's available on the National Improvement Hub dead easy to find if you just google WDLMLL it's quite a particular title there and it will come um, up on your, your, your Google, your search engine. And there's lots of examples there for early through to second at the moment. Um, examples of what that might look like to meet those digital literacy and digital skills, E's and O's and CFE. So lots of examples in there if you're just thinking um, stuff that I maybe don't cover tonight, you're thinking about other examples, there's loads in there that we've collected from educators across Scotland. So definitely worth having a look at that. So what I'd like to do is just invite you to have a wee moment to have a read at these um, reflective questions that I came up with for myself when I was planning this uh, and I really thought about when I'm teaching virtually or I'm using those digital resources, whether it's in my class or out of my class, uh, you know, learners are using it at home, in school, after school care, wherever it is um, in the early years centre, wherever my learners are learning and, and I'm asking them to work digitally or virtually, how am I planning that? So I want you to have a wee moment to have a read at those questions. And so again, that key one, does it suit online delivery? So if you're asking your learners to do something, does that activity suit them learning online? Or would it be better? Um, I'm, I'm thinking something such as modeling counting coins, if that's what you're doing for your numeracy E and O, and that's your, your, your learning experience there. That might just be something that is best done in class. You cannot guarantee, certainly in my household, I'd be struggling to find coins. I'd be struggling to find any change lying about. Um, most of my payments are done on cards. So, so that might not be, it might seem like quite a straightforward activity for them to do um, when they're at home for a bit of learning at home or homework. But does it actually suit being done at home? Or... Um, you know, if you wanted to do that as a live lesson on Teams or something, would 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 it? How practical would it be to have a, a group of ten learners or thirty learners, whatever, 
on teams trying to all share their webcam with you to show them counting different numbers of coins. So it seems very obvious, but sometimes um, we, we might just feel that, that we want an activity. We definitely want it done um, remotely or virtually, and it maybe doesn't always suit. Um, it might be something that's best done for the class. So an obvious one there. Again, start with these and O's and really planning out that learning. What am I going to assess? How is that assessment going to take the learning forward? And then finding your activity. So again, as I said, I, I saw great activities and examples when I, you know, as a class teacher and I'm looking online, I'm seeing great ideas, really creative. And I think that would be brilliant. My learners would enjoy that. But I have got that responsibility as a teacher to say, but is it going to take the learning forward? So they might love it, but how does it impact their educational outcome? So again, always going back to that. And the last one there is Mrs. Payton suggested in the chat, what happens when a learner is stuck and who is it that supports them? And again, I think if I, if I can remember, I should have it to hand, but the, the statistic, if I'm right, is it around about a third of adults in Scotland um, have said that they struggle to support their child past the age of eight with numeracy. So past the age of eight, homework becomes a challenge for the adults as well as for the learner. And you can imagine the strain and the stress that that could perhaps put on a family if they've got, even with one child, they might have multiple children struggling with different parts of home learning. Um, whether that's homework or because they're absent from school and whatever's happening there. So always having that in the back of your mind. How are you supporting those adults that support your young people and children at home? Um, is it having something like a class dojo? Is it having instructional videos for the adults rather than for the learners? Um, would that be more meaningful? Um, and again, if, are you sending perhaps um, as well as a sort of the learning task home? Is there guidance with that for your parents? So is the design there um, to support that? some big considerations in there, some obvious considerations, but say definitely worth thinking about those as you go forward. Um, the other one, um, I'm just going to flick, I'm going to close this slide a wee second and show you just as well to be sure about that when we're thinking about how we design um, the learning that we want our learners to do. If you've not seen it already, this is our digilearn.scot website, loads of fantastic um, information and resources on here. Um, if I do say so myself, but the, the learning paths page could be particularly useful here. Um, so again, it's got resources here to about you know, guidance and, and suggestions for, for, for teaching remotely or mixed or blended or whatever model it is you're taking forward with your learners. But I think especially useful here are things like the dual coding um, information. And dual coding, um, if you're unfamiliar with it, is um, that concept that if you were talking, if you had a presentation about the Romans, and you're talking about Roman soldiers explicitly, you would have a picture of a Roman soldier and you would have the words about a Roman soldier on the slide. You wouldn't just pick a random picture of a Roman to go with text about Roman soldiers, which might seem obvious, but again, you would be amazed the number of presentations you see. So again, making sure that's clear, that helps make it clearer for learners um, when they're accessing your materials that you share. And also again, if you're thinking about things like quizzes, um, your diagnostic question design. So when you create maybe multiple choice quizzes, you've got your right answer, your wrong answer, a, a kind of wrong answer and a very wrong answer perhaps, but there are particular misconceptions and obvious missteps and mistakes that learners will make. Um, and if you think about what those are, those well-known ones, I'm thinking if I ask my learner to do 17 take away eight in a a vertical calculation, they might think that they can't take eight away from seven, move eight to the top line and do eight take away seven because they know the biggest number, um, it, you take the smallest number away from the biggest number. So if they pick the wrong answer that has a one in the units column, that would maybe suggest to me that that's the error they've made. So I think those can all be really useful as well, especially for when learners are not in front of you. If you're asking them to do things online or at home, um, if you use those diagnostic questions, um, you can pinpoint the mistake that they've made a lot easier. Um, whereas if you just pick a kind of right answer and a kind of wrong answer, um, which I've done in the past, then you 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 can't be sure why they've made the mistake that they've made. So again, if we've not got them doing their working in front of us in a jotter, how else can we mitigate that? So I've got some other ideas around that. So I just want to check here, I've got some points coming in. I can see my teams is just flashing. So there's a few folk. Um, here, I've got loads, loads and loads of chat going on there after um, I moved back there. So uh, I can see there the equity is difficult. Um, I, I, absolutely, um, learners might not be able to access different things or parental engagement. And again, that's why I think it's really important that we consider the, the, the adults that are supporting our learners and, and how do we best support those adults as well. 
and um, Dojo something recommends using that as well. The NLC pedagogy team, you've seen great stuff from from you there, um, and about bundling those ease and to produce the themes of the digital school and considering how those go forward. Yep. Uh, teams is used to corporate uh, business outside school. As excuse me for this, I'll actually teams. teams is more relevant to life outside the school. Um yeah, um, absolutely. It's, it's it's used outside the school as well, so it could be a, a useful learning bit there. It, it, it might not suit your age and stage of learners, absolutely. So alternatives um, to that, um, and and there again, I think Mrs. Gary, I, I hope we're on the right line here. I, I think if parents don't have any experience of some of these things, if we're asking a learner to do something that learners have never done, again, I'm thinking you might even be asking your learners to do a really what seems like a really straightforward spelling activity. Again. Apologies if you're coming in from the secondary. My, my background is primary, so that's the obvious examples I'll come back to. Um, but again, if you're asking to do what might seem quite a straightforward spelling activity, but you're putting it on Teams, um, perhaps it's not the, the literacy, the spelling activity that's going to challenge the parents, the adults, the carers. It's perhaps the accessing Teams. So again, having that think about which support do they need? Is it accessing the learning or is it the, the actual learning itself? Um, and again, we've certainly all got a bit of thinking about that and I can see George Bream saying that uh, in the last minute having to learn how to use Teams um, so yeah having to learn how to and as, as ourselves as educators as well having to learn how to use Teams and then keep up with the latest in the learning and teaching such as you know literacy numeracy and other curriculum areas so lots and lots of learning going on for lots of different people so hopefully you'll find this flipped uh, the learning paths here really useful again some examples for engaging learners with different tools um, for in the classroom and for at home, so well worth dipping into those um, and having a, a wee look to see what suits you. So what I'd like to do then, I'm, I'm going to take it through, because they are the um, responsibility of all educators, um, I want to focus on literacy and numeracy, particularly across the curriculum, but that will come in handy whether you're at primary, um, early year centres or, or at secondary. Hopefully the, the examples will still be relevant to you. So the first thing I'd like to suggest um, is... I've put it in the format of a form here just because it was handy um, to, to pull it all together in one place but I'm going to suggest some different models for sharing the learning resources and putting them in one place for your learners to access. I'm going to share an example of that um, after I've talked about the literacy and numeracy examples um, about how to share it, that management aspect. So in the first instance, that classic flipped approach, I can make a quiz up, I can embed a video in it. Um, and again, if you've used forms or not, we've got webinars and short instructional videos already recorded about how to, to create a form, have a look at those. But forms quite straightforward to use in Glow, um, whether it's Teams or Google. And you can put a link into a video or you can put the video, you can embed the actual video in as well. And all the, all the how to do that um, is, is done within the forms. Forms will handle the embed in the video so you don't have to get embed codes or anything for that. But I can put a video in, ask my learners to watch it, and then answer questions. So again, that might mitigate them getting stuck as well. I'm giving them some of the answers. I'm giving them the text to read here. And by using a video, I'm hoping as well to mitigate perhaps some of the um, support needs that my learners might have, such as um, dyslexia um, or visual strains, stresses or anything like that. Again, there's, there's a consideration to be made. Um, on the access to the internet and the bandwidth for, for any remote learning. Um, again, if you're asking to watch lots and lots of videos, that could um, obviously put a strain on devices and um, bandwidth, etc. At home, that might be limited. So, again, worth considering that in your practice. I, I wouldn't be asking my learners to access long videos lots of times in a month. Uh, I would keep that in mind. So, thinking here, could give them a video to watch and then ask them to do a quiz on that so this becomes my text for my literacy again whether I teach history, biology, PE again the idea of using a video as a text um, can be really useful for accessing and again for engaging learners. Um, other ideas is well, I've just put in a link here just a text link into the question but it takes me to this um, thing link that someone has created again thing links been another handy tool uh, free version is available um, what it lets you do is take any image and add the little dots to it for your learners to interact with. And for each dot, you can add text, um, you can add sound recordings, so it could be yourself narrating or speaking, um, or a video clip. And again, you can link those straight to YouTube clips. But what this does is rather than, and again, I'm thinking perhaps at secondary school here, your learners might have what, seven or eight teachers, depending on their timetable. And if every teacher gives them 
um, notes, whether they're in paper or they're in Teams, or ask them to make a PowerPoint, or ask them to read you know, a, a fact file about something. If you're the teacher that gives them um, something like ThingLink, an interactive text, that might just be the difference to get them to engage with your learning um, rather than um, asking them to read another PowerPoint or watch another um, another video. So again, mixing up what you do, whether it's video or ThingLink. Again, ThingLink, free account, you can sign up, um, not a glow tool, um, but you can load any image. They have stock images as well, and then you can add the text. I've not created this one, so I can't take credit for that. Um, but you can add any information, so it's got an image and text, just text, a video, and again, you can add sound to it as well. So different ways of using, creating different text to engage your learners. And this goes the other way as well, rather than just you creating those interactive texts, your learners could be creating a text using ThingLink as well. So again, you could be using this as your resource. So rather than having to photocopy the, the reading books that you've got in school uh, and sending home copies of those or, or scanning them and putting them into Teams and all the issues around copyright, you could be creating your own text quickly and easily with tools like this. Uh, again, we did a webinar about ThingLink in the past, um, and again, you find lots of educators um, across Scotland sharing examples of them. I'd love to ask if you are one of those educators, you've made some ThingLinks, um, by all means, please do share them here in the team for us at the end of the call. Um, if, if you'd like to share those with other people, that'd be great to um, also be sharing some of those resources people have made. The other one as well I'd love to talk about in terms of text um, very quickly are the idea of using Google Earth. Now I know this is going to take a wee second to load. Um, so Google Earth for me is hugely um, underused. Uh, I've seen lots of good examples of schools using it, but I know lots of schools uh, still haven't perhaps. So uh, a fantastic tool, free to use, no sign up required. While that loads in the background here, I'd like to talk about one that is a resource that is in Glow, um, is screening shots. And in here there are um, Examples of how to teach film education, how to use film for literacy. There are resources to get you started, um, again, tutorials and again, some worksheets already made around that. But the best part is it comes with these videos to watch. So there's loads of films you can see there. Um, they're all copyright free. So even if you want to do a bit of writing of a text, um, you can download those films to say your iPad, for example, um, airdrop it to the pupils iPads and they can chop up the film, remove the sound, add their own sound to it so you can take um, a film and redub it in, in your own language. Um, some of these are foreign language films. You could reenact scenes from it. So loads of creative things to do with that. Um, but if we pick, uh, I know that my learners um, loved this one. We did, I did this with a, a, a group of children who I had in primary four, had them again in primary six. And the one I'd always say is, um, I never had a learner ask me if they could reread a reading book but this class um, always asked if we could go back and redo Slippery Tail. We, we'd done it in primary four. I get the same class again in primary six and, and, and they, they loved this story. They still ask, could we go back and revisit it? Which we did for a, a, a wee piece of writing. So, but you've got the film to watch here. Um, it's got notes, the synopsis, questions you can use, tips for how you analyse a film as you go as a text. Uh, again, how, how to break it down, activities for your learners and again, steps to take it on. We did this as a comprehension task. Can they understand the story? Can they read it? Read the film um, as a text? And then what I asked them to do was to, to write a recount based on them being the, the, the main character of the frog here. So they were to write a recount based on that. And, and the recounts were fantastic because they'd so much, they took so much in from the film. It, it really um, it helped develop the, the, the writing for that piece. So um, I would definitely go and have a look at that. There's a link for it in Glow. Um, you, can, you can sign up. Um, once you're into Glow, it sends you into that automatically. And it's got its sister site, Screening Shorts. Um, it's also in Glow, and that has got non-fiction films. Um, so well worth having a look at those. Google Earth. Um, so I think, again, if I'm doing a text and I want to ask my learners, I could ask them literal questions here. So this resource has been ready made by a, a, a company there. It's free to use. You can search for different sites on Google Earth, and there are resources ready made. Again, as a teacher, you can take a bit of time and go in and make your own um, your own factual information about the Coliseum and ask your learners to, to, to read that and answer questions. So literal questions, how many people could visit the Coliseum at one time and it's in its, its day, 50,000 people, so can they read and find that information? But I also think for more um, evaluative purposes, you could ask them, what do you think it would be like to be a gladiator? And with Google Earth and Street View, they can put themselves inside it 
and there could be some all your learners um, have never ever been to the Coliseum and rather than looking at it in a book or watching a video they can put themselves in it and control that movement and they can have a look and see you know can I put myself in the footsteps of someone that would have stood in this place again I remember seeing this in textbooks when I was younger that there were different levels to the Colosseum but it's quite hard to imagine that on a, a, a textbook a, a two-dimensional photograph um, but when I can manipulate the photo and look down at the, the, the different layers there and really see it in clear photographs as if it was there I can start to imagine that there was loads of levels there and what might happen in those subterranean levels so for me it's a fantastic tool um, again, you can then create a, a tour and it takes them on to, um, so we're going to go out and have a wee look at um, the outside view of the Colosseum, or again, um, I can jump across Rome here. The next one in this tour in particular is take me to the Pantheon, and then it makes a comparison with the, the US Capitol building. So it's saying it's a similarly cylindrical shaped building, but it's going to wheak me right across um, the earth to America, um, to Washington. So. You can take world learners on a whole tour of the world and, and this can be, as I say, literal questions here. Or again, you could be asking them to have a look at this and explaining what they think of it, to um, evaluate it, to analyse it, to make a comparison against something else that they know or they've experienced. So in terms of that literacy across the curriculum, how can you use these different texts? Um, again, this could be done in your classroom, it could be done at home. Um, and whatever stage of that blended learning um, approach you're taking or flipped learning, again, regardless of the model, these virtual lesson materials, that could be your textbook effectively for the year is something that you've created in, um, or for your, your term, something that you've created in um, Google Earth. So again, considering how you use that as a text, so rather than you know, uploading or finding a virtual copy of your reading book, what if you just change the reading book, what if, you, what if you use a different resource there and you can see here different ones that are on at different times of the year, so again if it's Diwali at the moment, there's, someone's created um, a guide to, to celebrating Diwali and that could be something relevant to your learners at this moment, again you could be doing a comparison with another country in the world, so there's, there's great projects ready made and again as the teacher you can go in and create your own topics, but again we don't need our learners to sign up to access this, However, if that was a route you did want to take, you could obviously take the, the, the relevant steps to, to get it checked um, for use in your school and your authority, but you could potentially use Google Earth and ask learners to create their own Google Earths about their local area. Um, so again, you could be getting to do something, I'm sitting here in Glasgow, you could be getting my learners to research Glasgow in the past, the present, and, and creating a geographical guide to Glasgow and, and, and bringing in loads about history and all of those different social subjects, these nodes you could easily be touching in there. So definitely something I would consider having a look at. What I do want to say though is, um, with uh, my experience, of, I've been working recently with my, my colleagues um, in the Literacy and English team and we've delivered some webinars around using digital learning and teaching to support Literacy in English recently and this one would come with a word of caution from some research by Alex Quigley, well worth having a look, I'll share the link with, to that with you later, I'm not going to ask you to watch the video right now, um, but there are um, research points to there being a deficit in learners' comprehension when they access online or virtual text or digital text. So whether that's on a phone, a tablet, a laptop, whether it's a website, a news page, it's social media, it's a video, whatever it is you're asking them to engage with as a text, when they read on a screen, they simply don't have the levels of comprehension that they would if it was on a printed page. Don't know why yet, but that is what the research is telling us. So what Alex Quigley is suggesting here are some strategies to mitigate that. In summary, when you are demonstrating on a, a virtual um, text like this, slow scrolling, so you're demonstrating that I'm taking my time, I'm going through, I'm reading it, I'm not just zipping up and down the page and saying there might be something useful there, move on. I'm talking about going into it, actually reading it, highlighting words that might be useful. And again, making notes is really effective, a really effective strategy in, in lessening that impact of reading on a screen. So, great opportunity to revisit note making and how learners really make notes that they don't just say copy, paste, dump that in my PowerPoint and present. So, talking about how they make notes, again, things that most of us, all of us are probably already doing, but Alex Quigley suggests being very explicit and modelling that slow reading, slow scrolling, and for me, I would suggest maybe the message there could be scanning, not skimming. And you really want to focus when it's a digital text on screen that they scan the text and not skim it. 
because they will skim um, by default. So really emphasizing and teaching, making explicit that they scan a text and they look for keywords, which words tell you what this sentence is about, what is this paragraph about compared to that one. So making all those um, evaluations and analyses as they go. So something to consider with that. What I'd like to then um, demonstrate, if I jump um, back to my slides, um, just having a see, I've put some questions on the slides here. Um, just jumping about a wee bit. So for literacy, just think about how do those different texts motivate our learners? How are they relevant to young people? Again, you, you know, can you use their cultural capital to engage them in the learning? So if your learners are obsessed with Minecraft or Roblox at a younger age or TikTok or Fortnite at an older age, whatever it is that they are interested in and they engage with, could you use that again as the text or the context to engage them in the learning? Uh, it's, it's a trick as, as old as the day, but again, it's sometimes best to go back and rethink about that. What is it they're accessing? How do they engage with that? Can I leverage that to uh, engage them with the learning? With regards to numeracy, um, what I've done with that, when I'm really thinking about uh, approaches to numeracy and support learners with that, uh, again, it's really taught about modelling, so it could be whatever subject you teach at secondary as well, um, considering how you model the, the learning and get learners to show you things like that back to them uh, or back to you sorry so for me the, the example I always like to talk about is MathSpot which comes highly recommended with some of my colleagues in the numeracy and maths team um, again I've got some short how to's for a couple of minutes each um, and, and a big long 10-15 minute video about how to use MathSpot and, and other tools like this to exemplify learners um, thinking and understanding so again um, I saw with um, I saw examples um, during lockdown of teachers who'd spent a long time that teachers that I knew um, who'd spent lots of time talking about you know concrete pictorial and abstract approaches to counting and that you know an idea like that this exercise in the screen I want my learner to make fifteen pence with coins and. Um, the, the real focus on this is how many different ways can they make 15 pence? What are the number, that the myriad of different ways they can make 15 pence? All those combinations and getting them to really think about how they do that. And again, if they're doing that with coins at home, how do you get them to evidence it? So I would be quite keen to use something like MathSpot that lets me just grab coins and put them in the page and then I can simply um, copy them and it will, it will duplicate them so I can make as many coins as I need. So I don't have to worry about having coins at home. This is my resource here. But again, if that's the activity, that could take me half an hour to come up with as many different combinations and exhaust it. There could be real deep learning going on there where I'm making all these links between working systematically, but you know, going through all the tens first, then going through all the five combinations, and then going through all the twos and then the ones, and then all the you know, getting up to the point I've got 15 one pences in the screen. That could take ages, but again. And, and it could be really deep learning going on there. Um, and again, it could be for different, you know, you could ask in chemistry, if I, if I give you, you know, a couple of different um, substances here, different um, atoms in a periodic table, how many different combinations could you make using, you know, that I've got one hydrogen and two oxygen in it, for example, or two hydrogen, one oxygen is only water. Can you make other um, substances that have that sort of, so, so whatever it is you're going to ask me to do, whatever your tool you've got for that, how do you evidence it in the classroom? Um, the simple example I would give with this would be, um, I'm on a, a Windows device, so I'm going to use screen, um, the snipping tool. So I'm just going to take a, a snip of the screen and, and pick those numbers. I'm going to copy it. Uh, and for me, the, 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 the obvious one to do here is paste it into OneNote. If you're using Google uh, in, in G Suite, you might well be using Jamboard for that. You could also copy and paste that image into a Word document, a PowerPoint, or Slides, or Docs, whatever format you're using. But the beauty is, with something like OneNote or Jamboard, the sort of virtual notebook, um, I'm then able to write on it. So if I've got a mobile device um, and it's got touch screen, for example, again, I know not every learner is going to have access to that but some of them will, um, and it's something you could use for the learning. Um, but then I can start to annotate it and simply draw on top of my screen here. So I can see here how I've went down it enough. These are all the combinations starting with 10. And again, as the teacher, it means I can go in as the teacher and view that, and, and, and yep, yep, that looks good. That, those combinations are great, and I can then um, when I spoke at the start again about inserting feedback, so I could write a comment, I could type a comment, 
let's go back to my cursor and I can also, because it's on OneNote, I can add a voice recording so I can say great job here, you've got lots of different examples, I like that you've worked systematically going down with the 10s and then the 5s and making the different combinations, um, but are there any other combinations you've not, you've not shown me here? So I can record them feedback, which is going to support the learning. So again, when I'm working in that online environment, how do I give them feedback? MathSpot, great, they can work on that, they can demonstrate it, but, but how do they get that learning to me? And I would suggest, again, they could use their mobile phone if they hadn't done this, and if it's a laptop, they could take their mobile phone, their iPad, whatever, let's take a photograph, they could email it, upload it in Teams chat, but for me, having a place... Um, everything should have a place for, for, for learning to go as it does in my classroom. I've got a space for my, my literacy jotters, a place for my numeracy jotters, my numeracy whiteboard. I've got my, my thesauruses in a cupboard, I've got my atlases in a cupboard, whatever, whatever else I need to access. I've got them all in a place. So again, it's about being clear with your learners. I want you to use these resources, but I want you to evidence the learning here. I want you to put it into whether it's a OneNote or a Word. I think to be clear with your learners about how you want that returned to you, handed in for assessment, and then again how you use that um, those tools to give them the feedback for that. So MathSpot comes well recommended um, by some of my colleagues. Um, I, I found it, it's useful and again others are available, um, but that's the example I would give. But think about how they capture that and share it back to you. But again the beauty is here, this is the resource they could do this at home but I don't know how they get that into their jotter. I might be quarantining jotters when they come back in, but if they hand it in to me on OneNote or Jamboard, then I can see this. Um, I might be um, absent from school, perhaps I'm unwell, or I've been asked to quarantine, or I'm working on my NCC, and I simply don't want to be going in and out of the classroom and somebody else is, is, is educating. So I could just jump into one board, uh, OneNote on my laptop or my mobile device, whatever it is, and review learners' learning. Again, if it's that blended approach and they've done this at home, it's not been done in class, I could be pulling it up on the screen in class and asking them to go over it. So it's not a homework jotter that's at home and I never see it or I only see it on a Friday when it gets handed in. They could have done this on Monday night and I could be talking with my learner about it on Tuesday, even if they've not brought that jotter back in with them or that activity back in because it's virtual, I can access it in class or they can access it at home. So that's really useful. Again, with forms, one of the, the, the lesser um, seen features sometimes I feel is the fact sticking with that um, that concept with, with, with numeracy and shown working if I create a new quiz one of the options I have for a question here in the screen so when I go to the add I can make new versions I can add a file upload so what you could do is have your 10 questions multiple choice for your maths or your chemistry, your physics, art, whatever it is, 10 multiple choice questions. And the last ad question, number 11, is a file upload question. So that when you learn that they could do, they're working on a piece of paper. They could paint you a picture for art and design, whatever it is, make a model. Um, they could photograph that and upload the photograph as a file for question number 11. So you could questions 1 to 10, they go through it as a quiz. Number 11, they can upload them, they're working and show you how they use that. So again, regardless of the different materials and resources you use, forms is a great way of handing it in, if you like, and giving feedback on that. So for me, that's with numeracy. The last wee part I want to talk about is organising that virtual classroom and how you share these links and bring it all together. But what I just want to do is very quickly just check Teams. I can see a couple of wee flashes here. Um, so people talk about using assignments, um, so you can give praise and feedback in there, absolutely. With forms, again, you can automate the feedback so that once they've done it, they, they, they get an automated piece of feedback. So these tools really support it. And what I'd like you to, to, to really consider here is, as you see with the, the example I had here, this um, Northland demo I had, had, had done with that group of learners there, was a form might seem dead basic and you use it lots, but simply by sharing a link to a thing link, my learner can access that thing link as the text and then answer as many questions as I like. I could get them to go look at a, a National um, Library of Scotland map, a historical map overlay on Google. I could use Google Earth, Book Creator. So again, if I want to look at a text here, Book Creator is great. You can make resources, they can make resources, but again, you can share that as a text. Learn about the Romans and then answer questions in a form, and, and someone says they're about using Teams forms and assignments to give feedback. So again, forms might be the way that you hand that um, 
so, so, so you can hand that in um, or hand it out and get it handed back into you. Uh, loads and loads and loads of bits. I'm going to come back to these. Nobody looks like they're quite asking a question, just lots of great suggestions. So, lots of great suggestions. I'll come back to those at the end and I'll crack on with the last wee part of this um, the, the webinar and the demonstration. So, my example here is not the, the best, it's not the prettiest example you'll see. There's loads of fantastic examples of these floating about in things like Teacher Twitter. Um, so by all means, you know, go and use whatever format works for yourself. I, um, I'm going to show you the model in a wee second. But the, the example I've used is using ThingLink. Um, you might want to make a video playlist on um, YouTube or a Flipgrid. You could make a Flipgrid channel with, with lots of wee videos explaining different strategies for counting with the concrete pictorial and abstract. That's up to you how you want to share that. You might want to use so we've put um, a, a link to the um, so I've used forms there so I'm using a form of different multimodal texts um, you might want to use something like Wakelet see lots and lots of Wakelets going around just now and you could create a, a list of here are the 10 resources we use in our class again great example if I'm right from Mar uh, and uh, South Ayrshire have created the, the digital fire drill example I saw that on Twitter last week maybe that's something you want to consider as well your what if scenario so these blended learning um, virtual learning resources are great for learners being in the class being out the class learning at home learning in class blended whatever approach you take but what happens if all of a sudden they're unable to attend they've got to quarantine for two weeks perhaps or someone at home is um, what do they need to know and what do they need to have to hand for that happening in an emergency or a, or a quick turnaround so that's the idea at you know, I'm, I'm thinking about here, where do I share these? Is it in my class um, materials in Teams? Is it um, in a materials assignment on Classroom? Whatever format I'm using, where do those resources go for my learners? And they should always be in the same place. By all means, change them, but they should always be in the same kind of place. So all I've done is got a stock photograph of a classroom there. I've put it into PowerPoint and I've added some, some rectangles with text and text boxes change the transparency, they could be totally solid, uh, the colour that, you know, irrespective. Um, I've added the text on PowerPoint and then I've saved that image, uploaded it to ThingLink um, and again I've, I've put in the, the wee buttons here for ThingLink. So my literacy and English resources are in the red tree because that's roughly what I've got in the classroom. Um, my literacy area is red. Um, so when my learners go in they know that's where Book Creator is. So this is my Book Creator library and I want my learners to complete a task. The writing for the writing um, this term, they are creating their own books and publishing those in Book Creator. So, if that's the resource I'm using, I'm putting that in the literacy tray so my learners can access it. They don't have to remember where Book Creator is. They don't have to go through channels and teams finding it. I mean, again, thinking about secondary learners could be in you know ten, ten different teams across a whole range of subjects and curricular areas. So. It might be that you want to just put them in one place. This is where you share your resources for your class. Uh, again, screen and shorts. I don't want them to have to go into Glow and I can't find it in Glow. Um, I, I don't know which channel it's on. I can't remember what it's called. This is the resource I want you to use. There's the link to it. When I was in the classroom, if I wanted my write, learners to write in a jotter, I gave them the jotter to write on. I didn't expect them to find the jotters. They, they were handed out to them, they were provided to them. So that's all I'm thinking here. I'm doing the same thing with my, my, my virtual classroom here. I say you see much nicer looking examples than mine's. Again, social subjects, I want them to access Google Earth for their, their, their topic learning, or I want them to, to use their Jamboard to share their ideas. So those links are all put in a place where they can find it. On ThingLink, once you've uploaded the image, you put the wee um, dot, whether it's a video, a text, or an image, get to choose that from a menu, and then when you publish it, you share this link to your learners, Again, I would put that into my class team or on my class blog or my wake, whatever I use to communicate with my learners there. And they know when they go to my team, they click on the link and these are the resources for the learning. You could have an individual one for numeracy, one for literacy, one for science, one for computing science, whatever you want to do. That's entirely up to you. But I think it's only fair for your learners that you put things in a place that they consistently can access those. So we're not putting different things in different files and one day you're putting a link to the learning in the assignment but the next day you just put it in the post it in the channel and i'm sure people don't do that but again 
just that wee reminder, consistency, high standards and expectations as we would have in our classroom, that we have that for our virtual um, environment as well. The last wee bit I just want to just reiterate again, those different um, reflective questions to have a think about. I hope these ideas, there's some new ones in there for you that you've maybe not seen. That's always good. I hope that the ones that maybe I have shown you and you have seen are perhaps illustrated a different context or a different approach or method to using them that, that is useful to you and you've, you've not sat and watched something you've already seen. Um, but the key part for me is irrespective of these different resources um, and activities you ask them to do virtually or in school, you consider whether it's these reflective questions, you make up your own, you've got something for that in your own establishment or authority. But for me, the quality of learning and teaching is at the fore. You're trying to engage the learners and there's no better way we all know to engage learners than to make it relevant and challenging. Nobody likes it when it's too easy. Nobody likes it when it's too hard. Um, and again, how do you support learners when, they, when it is a bit too hard? Um, what support have you got for parents, the parents and carers and adults at home? Do they need support with that learning concept, such as how to find elements in the periodic table? Is that what they need support with? Or do they need support with forms and teams? Or do they need support with all of those elements so sometimes you could be prepared for that and again that is an extra ask it is an extra challenge but um then perhaps just sending home paper based homework um but that's something we, we should consider as we design these learning episodes and again where's that effective assessment so if you've asked them to use book creator that's great it looks nice but how are you assessing it and what are you assessing one of the ones I would, for example if, if i asked my learner to create a poem ask them to write a poem that we then, I then filmed them reading the poem aloud and then they used um, green screen to add a background to that. Which part am I assessing? Am I assessing the poem? Am I assessing the reading aloud? Or am I assessing the digital skill to add a background and, and publish that and present it as a video? I can also ask myself, does the green screen impact the writing? So is the writing better because they know they're going to get to use that digital engagement at the end or does the digital part at the end actually just hurry them on and perhaps they don't focus too much on the writing because they want to get to the iPad part and use the video. So consider all of those things. Is it relevant? Is it something they can do at home? Someone said right at the very start in the comments about equity and access to different devices. That's something again to consider. Are you asking them to go and access things like an iPad or apps which only really work with mobile devices um, whereas perhaps you know that your learners have got access to a laptop at home so they're not going to be able to access a whole range of apps or again are you asking learners to access things on a laptop that might be shared perhaps an adult in the house is using that laptop for work and you've asked them to um, do the learning on the lap you know powerpoint for the day does powerpoint suit a mobile device as well as a laptop so Again, maybe a wee bit of research and discussion with your learners to find out what they can access and when so that you can design the right task that suits most of your learners. Again, you could leave it open-ended and say, create me a text, and that could be a PowerPoint, a book creator, a Google Earth. It could be a video of them talking on their mobile phone, just a simple screen recording to send that back to you. It could be written on a piece of paper, and perhaps that's what we need to consider as well, that virtual learning, that um, it might be something you're asking them to do remotely, but they, they might not be able to access all those different resources. That will depend on the format of the device that they have. So um, th those are the bits I would ask you to consider at the the, the, the end of the, 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 the material is considered for the learner and it suits the task as well. We're not just doing it because it looks good, it looks fun, is it meaningful, is it relevant, is it engaging and do we assess it going forward? Last wee part, just before I ask it, um, just before we finish up tonight, my colleague Susan Say is co-hosting um, a, a webinar that I believe will complement this fantastically. Um, I think they'll, they, they would go really well. They'll both be recorded. Um, so even if you, you miss tomorrow's one, it'd be well worth checking that out because I think um, she's speaking with a practitioner who has taken that kind of blended approach to, to, to te working with learners who are in and out of school and working at home and blending that into what's happening in the school as well. So um, that would be a, a webinar that is definitely worth um, taking the time to catch if you're able to and if not, um, tune in, in on and um, catch up via YouTube. If I'd like to thank you firstly for coming along tonight. I hope that has proved useful and, and I'm able to, to give you some examples there 
of, of, of new things, but also maybe revisiting some things that you have seen before, but in a different way, a different light. I'd like to ask you um, if you can complete the form first. Um, there's an evaluation form, which is really helpful. Um, it just lets us know in the team what worked well tonight, what didn't work. Um, please fill that in and, and let us know what we can do to make sure that the, the professional learning we offer is as relevant as possible for you. Um, and that helps to... Um, so Susan's webinar is, is on our, our blog page. You'll see it. Um, I, I will get the link to that and I will put it into this chat. Um, so that evaluation helps us just design our professional learning. It hopefully meets your needs better because of that. Um, so if you can fill out the form, much appreciated. I will share the slides from tonight. I'll post them up later once everybody's finished commenting. Um, and people are always very kind and say thank yous. Um, but that just means that the, the presentation will get lost. So um, I will post the presentation in about 15 minutes. Um, once I have um, captured, finished capturing and rendered the video, I will post it to our YouTube channel and I will share that as well. What I will do in 10 minutes once I'm posting the link to these slides, I will also post a link to Susan's webinar. Um, I'm sure there's still spaces. Oh, there's brilliant. There's Louise. Didn't see snuck in the back there, Louise. Thank you. Um, Louise is sharing um, that practitioner example of blended learning, so that's perfectly timed there. Thank you. Um, there's an evaluation form. Um, it's in there, so I've just shared it again. Mrs. Coventry asking there. So again, as I say, people once they start to say thank you, which is very kind, um, uh, it starts to bump that evaluation form up the chat. But you, it, it'll be there if you scroll up um, past the last few comments. You'll see the the link to the form um, to feedback. And I hope it's the right form. Uh, some people have already done it. Thank you very much. So. Thanks for taking the time to join us. I hope it's useful. If there's any other questions or you've got any great suggestions, post them into the channel here. Share us. If you've made a thing link or a virtual classroom or anything like that, it'd be great to see those examples shared with your fellow practitioners. Um, absolutely fire them into this team and, and let us know. Um, what I'm going to do for the last few minutes, you are free to go. That's well, you're free to go whenever you like. Um, Thanks for joining us, but um, if you are staying on the call, I'm just going to have a wee quick run through it and see if there's any comments and just to go over some of the bits that people have said and see um, how useful these ideas are. So if anybody wants to chat and discuss any of those, I'm going to turn off, I'm going to allow you to unmute. And if anybody wants to have a quick discussion about any of these um, points, I'm just going to allow you to unmute. Give me a wee second to play with the settings. And if you want to have a chat about that, you're welcome to stay on for 10, 15 minutes, have a wee chat about any points. Um, and if, if not, free to go and I will hopefully see you at future webinars. Thank you. So if I'm just going back through the chat here, I can see some people talk about Class Dojo and things. I think we spoke about those ones. Miss Lamont saying equity is difficult there. Absolutely. Um, sometimes I think as well, though, there are online resources. I always think... Um, you know, again, different mobile devices, different tools, but things like an iPad, if you just treat it as a, a, a camera and a web browser, um, that can seem quite expensive, but if you have iPads and you look at things like everyone can create and all the resources that go with that, the learning, um, the lesson plans, the, the learning um, modules it gives you, then all of a sudden you've got a, a video camera, you've got a, a still camera for taking photography, um, you can draw, you can paint, and there are loads and loads of things. So again, if, if perhaps your school has invested and learners have access to something like an iPad, you could be using that as your app resource, which could start to become more accessible. There's other drawing and music tools available. Google, um, Google um, the, the Chrome Music Lab. If you Google that, Chrome Music Labs, it's got a free, um, very simple music maker based on patterns. Um, and again, that could be something you could use to create um, a wee bit of music that again you, you, you know perhaps learners don't have a, a cello at home so um, there, there are resources like that that we can use to again support learners that might not have lots of different things again the maths manipulatives on maths but great you can count on learners having lots of coins or you know count you know if you do number bonds one to twenty and you're saying you know, just use tins of food in the house might not be twenty tins of food in the house to, to count out and make those number bonds so Again, go and pick sticks out the garden. Might not have a garden. So always making those considerations about equity. Digital is the same. We've just got to consider what we're asking them. Are they able to access it? Um, Mrs. Brown was saying about the NLC pedagogy. I think we spoke about that earlier on. Absolutely. I've seen some examples of that. Um, 
um, that how they bundled the E's and O's to produce the themes for the digital school. Those are working really well. It looks like that's going to be really, really effective for support teachers and educators in, in North Lanarkshire. Um, so as we've been talking about teams, we spoke about that part. Yet there's, there's perhaps that challenge of having to learn how to use teams and how to do the, the actual curriculum part of the learning. So how to, how to add numbers together is, is one challenge, but having to access that in teams might be another. Um, so the IT has been a steep learning curve. Absolutely, I think we're all learning the Mrs. Game and hopefully these webinars and, and the different resources we're sharing in Digital and Scott help some way with that. Um, but again, if there's anything we can do to help, please do get in touch and see if there's, there's any other bits. Uh, Jennifer Lilly saying some of the learners are isolating using Seesaw. Um, yep, other platforms um, than Teams in, in Classroom. Most pupils and activities, it's, so it can be interactive and they can do it offline if they haven't got it. So again, yeah, Jennifer, exactly planning for, can they do it online, can they do it offline? Is it something they can do in school or out of school? And, and there's maybe that wee extra bit of thought, but I think if we consider those a bit like with GERFEC, and we consider how we engage all learners, um, which, which we must do, we must make learning accessible to everyone. If you start with an activity and try to make it accessible, that can seem time consuming and quite, uh, it sometimes loses its, its value. But if you start with making it accessible, and that's certainly in terms of equity as well as accessibility, but if you start with making it accessible, um, it might take a wee bit longer at the start, but it certainly make, makes it more meaningful for the learners. NRC produced phoneme and spelling lessons through PowerPoint animation. Um, those would be great to see. I'll maybe speak to Mrs. Brown about um, getting a wee practitioner example of those. Again, I forgot to say in the webinar, if you are still here, um, if you've got any practitioner examples, share those with us at DigiLearn Scott. You'll see the page to um, share that. Forms is great once you get the hang of it. Yep, we've got some videos to help you get the hang of it. Um, Mrs. Brown and Miss Byers talk about things in North Lanarkshire. Miss Lamont uh, making use of Thing Link. Uh, absolutely, if you've used it, we'd love to see some examples of that. Share them with us on Digital and Scott, either at Twitter or on our blog. Um, again, Mrs. Brown took MathSpot. Um, Mrs. Scott would encourage your pupils to use assignments in Teams. Absolutely, that pays that feedback. And again, I would be, um, you might want to have a wee look in. We've done some um, videos and some examples around using rubrics to provide that feedback. Uh, and again, in fact, feed forward. So if you create a, a rubric um, to go alongside the learning task you've done in assignments, um, your learners could actually use that to aim, to, 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 to self-evaluate as they go, and, and perhaps even self-evaluate at the end of the learning, so that before you've even given them feedback, they could um, give their own feed um, forward, so they could be taking their, their ideas forward for the next steps. Assignments here, I like that as well, Miss Sensor says we use it every week, so again, learners getting familiarity, Miss Spires, Praise and feedback be given each child when it's available for all children here and see. Um, you can, um, I know some parents would like the children's feedback given publicly. Again, that's up to you. You might have um, blogs set up and glow for each individual learner and you can give them feedback privately. You might have a class blog, you want to share it there. Um, you could give praise and feedback on Teams in the, the or classroom in the, the, the posts or the, um, the chat part in, in Google Classroom as well. So you could give that feedback publicly to your class there or uh, again that's your school's policy how you feedback and um, but you can certainly do it privately through the class notebook um, and teams for example each learner has their own notebook you can feed back to them privately in there with the, the say the verbal feedback or with forms that's done privately there uh, you always get someone handed in the homework again you can check that within teams as well and um, the, the bit I would always suggest is some learners engage with some homework more than others but the the more um, create if you make the homework the, the more likely they are engaged but that's always a challenge some learners just don't like it but Mrs Scott's saying yep you know she's answering the one about feedback assignments you can monitor that engagement as well with insights and in teams Mr Gavin said but you, you can monitor the engagement so yes you've got assignments there, assignments there. Mrs Brad has talked about Google Slides uh, again you can use that for a whole bunch of things as, as much as you can in PowerPoint so Miss Inkster saying, yep, homework's not always handed back, um, but that kind of depends on your learners. Made a folder with resources and called it the resources folder. Yep, absolutely, Mrs. Scott. So whether you want to make a fancy thing link or uh, a way clip or you just want to make a resources folder in Teams, as long as it is accessible to learners, everything's in a place they know where to find it. You're absolutely spot on. Um, it's been recorded, uh, Miss Angus, it is recorded. I'll post it on um, 
YouTube by the end of the week. I will share out the PowerPoint at the end. You're welcome, Miss Lamont. I've, there's the webinar. Um, the webinar was called Practitioner Examples of Blended Learning, which Louise has shared the link to in the chat. Um, someone asked how we feedback. I've shared a form. Um, you're very welcome, Mrs. Peyton there and Jennifer. Lots of people saying thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks for joining us. I hope I've just went through and read all the questions, the comments there. Hopefully that's given you something to think about, some other ideas. And I'm just getting down to see if there's any new questions and see if anybody has anything they want to ask before we go. If not, I will finish the call and bid you all good evening.